All right. Hey, welcome. I'm going to be doing a video lesson for you guys today. Um, I uh, was going to be taking a day off and just processing some things. Um, I can share real quick. I was uh, a second responder for a, a rather tragic car accident on Wednesday night, processed it a little bit the next day on Thursday, and uh, just felt like I needed to take a, a day off and, and think about um, think about what I had experienced. So that's why I'm doing a video lesson for you guys. And um, so usually these turn into conversations. So if, uh, if you would like to pause throughout and have a discussion, uh, please feel free to do that. But also um, do your best to try to, to make your way through this as a class together as it's being cast up on the TV. Okay, so we finished. Um, last class period and I'm going to pick up roughly in the same place where everyone um, everyone was, all the different classes. So we looked at a quote from C.S. Lewis, um, actually it comes from an appendix at the, at the last part of the book, uh, written by a, a doctor, but still comes from the book. Um, and then we looked at another quote here. One of the classes was stuck here a little bit on the Judas John paradigm, just started to have, asking all sorts of questions. That was fun. Um, <clears throat> and then we looked at this idea of, you know, this is probably one of C.S. Lewis's uh, most famous quotes from this book. It says, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And <clears throat> I do think moments of extreme pain and tragedy really have this awakening effect uh, in our life, and if I could just quickly speak even about the the accident that I witnessed um, on Wednesday night, there are three things that come to mind. What does it mean when we say that pain is a megaphone to wake us up? Um, well, um, after seeing what I saw, uh, it was a double fatal accident, and I had to help one of the officers um, with something. I'm not going to go into details. It's not your burden to carry. Um, but I was thinking about this on the way home. Okay, that wakes me up because I want to I want to know that I know in my heart that I have a relationship with Christ. It wakes me up. I want to know that I know that I have asked Jesus for forgiveness of my sins. I want to know that I know that I have this relationship with God, this you know, this knowledge of God that we've been talking about in theology class, not just facts as if it's a checkoff list, but I want to have this knowledge, this intimate relationship with Christ. I want to know that I know that that's true and settled in my heart. That's kind of like the, the first thing that I was thinking about. The, the second thing that I was thinking about specifically was, it's practical. It's like, you know, you guys are starting to drive um, as sophomores with your permit, but then also getting your, your driver's license. And I'm just thinking to myself, why not, why not just save that two-minute text message when the car is parked? Put the phone away, right? Um, when I see pain over here, it wakes me up practically to what am I doing really in the car? Put the phone away. Um, the third thing, it wakes me up specifically as I think about the relationships that I have with people. Um, I was, I was talking to one of the survivors that night, uh, trying to calm her down and help her. Um, and she lost her sister. Her sister was the one driving in the car. And she will never get to say, uh, uh, give her a hug ever again. And again, this is not a shame or a guilt trip or anything like that, but recognize the family that you have, your, your parents, your siblings, um, your friends, uh, and truly know that, hey, Go give, that you can give them a hug and, and say that you love them. Um, the person who lost their sister on Wednesday night, they will never have that opportunity again. It, it wakes me up, like, like this pain that I'm experiencing here, it wakes me up to do something about it. And I, I do believe pain and suffering and evil have that motivating power to push us to do what we ought to do, um, even in the face of adversity. What the enemy wants to happen is for us to go through something challenging and for us to just give up and, and not continue the fight. But that's why this quote has become one of the most famous from this book, The Problem of Pain, uh, written by C.S. Lewis. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, 
but shouts in our pains. It is, mega, it is megaphone, his megaphone, to rouse a deaf world. So then we looked at, at least a couple of classes got here. Um, again, just trying to prime the pump uh, of your mind. What we're not trying to do with this list, because these are real problems, again, what we learned in the debate is that Christians deal with reality. This is what is our problem in our, in our world, in our culture. Whereas we saw the atheist says, well, there's no explanatory power. We don't really need to explain what's going on here. It is what it is. It's just dumb suffering. But the Christian, again, wants to set that aside and say, no, we're dealing with reality. And there's all sorts of issues as it relates to what we all experienced in 2020 and continue to experience in 2021. Um, so again, I only highlighted a few of these. But as a Christian, the last thing we should do is simply respond red, blue, Democrat, Republican. You know, that's a response, but it's not enough. The Christian's the one that steps, takes a step further and says, okay, what am I going to do about this um, in terms of following Christ? Not just finding yourself on either side of the party line, but following Christ. And reading the scriptures and saying, this is what I believe Jesus would do. Um, and, and loving their neighbor. So we went over a couple of these, for example, if, uh, you know, the refugee crisis. Um, certainly we could come up with all sorts of explanations for what's going on, solutions politically, how to solve this problem. And also we ought to have a broken heart for people who their family members are ripped apart from each other. Um, and what are we going to actually do about that? Um, and we use that as an example, or you could use racial injustice, which is alive and well in our world. Um, again, these are real things that are happening in our, in our culture, in our context, and Christians, because we believe in that this is reality, have to respond to it. So then we looked at a, a couple of these, at least uh, the majority of classes, but I think my period two didn't really get this far. So again, um, now would be a good time to pause if you if you've already covered this one to talk about it if you haven't um, then we can look at the scripture together but god has a purpose um, in everything he allows now don't forget there's two ways in which god has the purpose accomplished and fulfilled uh, permissive and directive will god permits certain things to happen then he directs certain things to happen and we looked at this verse and especially in the context of uh, Proverbs 16, 4, which I want to briefly cover one more time for you guys because it is very important in terms of understanding what God is saying here. Um, so it says, the Lord has made everything for its purpose, or it specifically says in another translation, the Lord works out everything for its intended end, its intended goal, its intended purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. So what is the wicked? What is the day of trouble? What does that look like? So real quick, once again, the, the Proverbs, at least in this section, are considering the perspective of mankind and considering this perspective of God. Um, and the text in verse 2, it says, you know, mankind, they do what seems right in their own eyes. And as I mentioned before, and I just have to say it again, Satan thrives in this area of what seems right in our own eyes. You can do a survey throughout scripture, but you don't have to move the pages too far to find stories where that is true. Satan shows up, Genesis chapter 3, puts a thought in the mind of Eve. And something that I like to ask the class is this question, when was the last time Satan actually showed up with an entire army of demons to really try to tempt you? And the assumption to that question is he doesn't. He doesn't show up with an entire army. Um, what he does, the influence of Satan, is to put a thought in our mind. He shows up to Eve and says, did God really say? And then Eve ended up doing what was right in her own eyes. Well, it seems as if the fruit is good. Ah, I'm going to go ahead and take that fruit. And again, Satan thrives in this area of what seems right to us. So be careful. Just because you have a thought in your mind doesn't mean that's actually God's purpose for you. Um, but again, that's where the permissive, God will permit you uh, to do certain things. He'll let those things happen because he's not going to take away your free will. God respects your choice so much that he will not manipulate you, coerce you, or push you in any direction other than the way that you want to go. Ultimately, that's how it works in scripture. 
And so the solution and or suggestion from the psalm, uh, the Proverbs here is we ought to be those who commit our way to God because he's the one who checks our motives. So the proverb says, hey, commit your ways to God because what seems right to you may not in fact be ultimately what is good for you. And so we're supposed to commit our ways because then God is going to check the motives of our heart. And in that prayerful conversation, again, do we know God? Is it, do we have a relationship with God? In that prayerful conversation, you will begin to learn how to discern, yes, this is what God wants for my life. Ultimately, this is the plan and purpose that God is working out to its end. And this is, this is good, so I'm going to go for it. But if I don't pause to commit my way to the Lord, then I am simply going to do what seems right in my own eyes. And then I'll even per, perchance call that a good thing and pure. But what the Proverbs continue to say is that if you don't commit your ways to God, what ends for you, the end result of that, lack of committing your way to God, is disaster. And ultimately, what follows disaster in that experience is death. Again, to use the story of Genesis 3, as Satan shows up and pushes Eve to continue to do what seems right in her own eyes. Eve doesn't commit her way to God. Certainly if Eve paused just one moment to say, God, should I do this? And God would say, no, I told you not to do that. Then her way would have ended perhaps in life. But her way ended along with Adam's way in disaster and death ultimately. And then the Proverbs in this section in verse 5 say, that is the end of the proud heart the way of disaster. Now I'm going to get to this idea a little bit later at the end. So I'm just going to put a box around that, living for others. There's something about this idea that is helpful, especially as it relates to living for um, God's purpose. Now this verse ends, even the wicked for the day of trouble. So God has an intended purpose does God want this day of trouble to happen to anybody? In just a couple of moments here, we're going to learn, no, no, God, in fact, doesn't find any pleasure in that. Um, so let's keep going here. Now, um, again, you can pause right now and have a conversation about this statement. What do you guys think about it? God's wrath is righteous. Um, do you guys think God's wrath is righteous? So again, if you want to hit pause, go ahead and do that now and have a discussion. When you're done, you can um, hit play again. Um, so, assuming you had a conversation about that, it's good to identify your words. What is wrath, you know? And last semester we had a brief conversation about being angry, and certainly I think it is okay for us to express this emotion, anger. There are right things for us to be angry about, um, and certainly there are not right things for us to be angry about. Jesus, in fact, said, if you have hatred in your heart, deep down inside, very angry at your brother to the point where you hate them. Um, Jesus says, that's murder. You've committed murder. Um, but then elsewhere in the scriptures, it says, be angry and sin not. Don't be angry in the sense that you're stewing in hatred over a brother um, or a sister in Christ. But we're supposed to be angry at the things that we see in this world that cause uh, injustice. Um, and not to stand idly by and not do anything about it. Um, so this verse here, God's wrath is righteous. God himself also has this ability to emote um, when bad things are happening. And it says in scripture that he does pour out his wrath on people that end up rejecting his ways ultimately. And pouring out wrath uh, in the scriptures talks about the judgment of God. And as we saw in Proverbs 16, just in that last sli uh, slide, those who don't commit their way to God and continue to do what seems right, led astray by the enemy, will end in disaster and death, and your end result will be pride. And God, rightly so, because you've rejected God's way, will end in wrath. Um, and here's a Bible verse that discusses that. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. Now here's the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So it's their unrighteous way because they don't commit it to God 
They do what seems right in their own eyes. They therefore suppress the truth. They know the right thing to do, but they don't do it. And it says that, for what can be known about God is plain to them. And we talked about this in the previous unit in Bibliology, where what is known about God in a general sense, uh, general revelation, what is known about God is plain to absolutely every single person. So it's plain to them because God has shown it to them. And we can see that through the created order. We can see that through how people engage with one another uh, as being uh, image bearers of God. It's plain to us. We know what's the right thing to do. We know it is the right thing to do, but because oftentimes we don't commit our ways to God, we therefore suppress the truth. Um, so I could also write that here. When I don't commit my way to God, I end up suppress, I'm just going to put suppress um, the truth over here. Oops, pardon me. Um, that dot got in my way. Suppress the truth. We end up suppressing the truth when I do not commit my way to God. So again, here's another statement where you can hit pause and kind of talk about this if you'd like as a class for a couple of minutes, see what you think about it. Um, the immoral minds of the wicked are evidence of human rebellion against God. So now would be a good time to pause and then come back in a second. So assuming you did that, you've hit play again. Here's a verse that talks about that. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased or immoral mind to do what ought not to be done. Now, pause there for a second and really think about what the verse is saying. God gave them over to this. This is, this is ultimately their choice. So that's why I have this here. God ultimately gives us a choice. He gives us a choice and then in a sense, giving us back over to our own way if we don't want to submit to him. Why does he do this? Again, because he respects your choice in the sense that he is not going to violate your own will to make a decision to commit yourself to God. And so he gives us a choice. So he is giving them over to their immoral mind saying, okay, this is the end result. This is ultimately what you want. Then that's your choice and disaster is going to come to you. And so here it says they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness because you are filled with all manner of unrighteousness when you are not committing your way to God. And he has a list here. Evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, Let's pause there for a second. I'm just joking. Foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Man, and that list goes on and on in other places of scripture. When we go, when we forget to commit our ways to God, it ends in disaster. And that is a list that uh, speaks of the disaster that is our end when we don't commit our way to God. So here's another um, Here's another one. God has the final say and is always loving and just. So again, pause and talk about that in the class. Do you agree with that? Do you disagree? How would you nuance it? How would you say it differently? Um, but assuming that you hit pause and now you're back, um, it says here in Romans, what shall we say then? Is, is there injustice on God's part? Because that's a question that we might ask. God gives us over to this to our own way. Is, is, now, is there injustice? Like what's, what's God up to? Paul says, by no means, and that's emphatic in the original language. He says, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. So when you commit your way to God, when you're in this safe space over here in God's care, it's no longer your own will or your own, uh, or, or your own exertion. God is Ultimately, when you commit your ways to God, I'm going to put another arrow here. God is going to show you mercy, ultimately, and he is going to show you compassion. So perhaps in the very committing of your way to God, what you commit to him, what if it's not right? What if you're like, hey, God, this is what I want to do with my life. This is the trajectory of where I see myself going after high school. This is how I want to live my life in college. 
you know, and the list could be like, when I go to college, I'm no longer going to have to listen to my parents. Therefore, I am going to drink. Uh, I'm going to do drugs. I'm going to have relationship after relate. You know, sometimes college students feel this sense of freedom all of a sudden. This they don't have to listen to their parents anymore, so they're just going to do whatever whatever they want. Say you're wise and you actually commit that your that way to God. This is what I want to do, God. God is going to say no. That that's not a good idea. Um, but guess what? In that transaction, he's going to show you mercy and he's going to help you realize, hey, this is not about ultimately what you do, but the grace that I give you. And I think that's what Paul is talking about here. So continues for the scripture says to Pharaoh. Now he's using Pharaoh as an example. We already had a conversation about Judas because Judas was the example in the New Testament where he ended up doing what he wanted. God gave him over to that way. Um, same thing happened with Pharaoh in the Old Testament. So it says, for scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I have raised you up that I might show my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. So using Pharaoh as an example, God allowed Pharaoh, because he's not going to take away his choice, to do what he wanted to do. And it says there in the original Old Testament story that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, but it also says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And if you've done any work with cement, um, I only have like once or twice in my life. Um, I tend to stay away from hard labor. I like doing word studies in the Bible instead. But anyway, um, when you work with cement, you mix it up and you let it set there. Um, it's setting and it is it is cementing itself in the way that you formed it. Now, the heart, you could use that example to talk about the hardening of a heart. God hardened Pharaoh's heart in the way that Pharaoh was hardening his heart. And it goes back to that idea here that God will give us over to our own way if we don't commit ourselves. God will commit you to your own way and say, this is ultimately what you wanted. It's not God forcing you to do that. He's simply recognizing and saying, okay, this is what you wanted. And we see a clear example of that in the Old Testament with Pharaoh. We see a clear example of that in the New Testament with uh, Judas. Okay, and we don't have to spend too much more time, so you don't have to pause on these. These are just more general statements. God will punish the wicked. And I think that's been clear um, already in this presen presentation. There's a Bible verse that goes with that one too. God does, now this is where I want to camp for a second. God doesn't take pleasure in this destruction though. So this disaster that's happening for people that do not commit their way to God, it's not like God's up in heaven like, yay, that's awesome. They're going to, their life's going to be miserable now. Ha ha, got them. Like that is not God's attitude sometimes, although people interpret God's attitude that way. And that's not appropriate because the scriptures say here, as it says in the book of Ezekiel, have, and God's asking a question, have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked? When people don't commit their way to me, do I have any pleasure in that? Declares the Lord, and, and not rather that, that he should turn from his way and live. So, so in fact, what God wants to happen is for us to live like he wants us to experience life that's what god wants and then we're going to identify and find out what that kind of living looks like in just a second here but god wants us to live like he doesn't want us to experience disaster and death and come to the end of ourselves because our heart is just so full of pride and we've hardened ourselves and not committing our ways to the lord by suppressing the truth and everything that we had discussed up until this point that's not that's not what god wants he takes no pleasure in that. So if anybody at the end of the day says, well, yeah, God's just happy all this bad stuff's happening. Again, that is a theological idea. They're thinking about God, but that thought is incorrect. It's not the correct way to think about God. God doesn't take pleasure in the death of the wicked. And so um, God uses suffering to test the genuineness of our faith. So um, as we experience the problem of pain, suffering, and evil in our own life, he uses that um, to test, hey, what is really genuine? So I do believe, um, based on this verse here and other ideas in the scripture, as we continue to commit our way to God, 
The question is, will everything always go just dandy and fine, happily ever after? No. And, and we have scripture that says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, just a small while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold or Bitcoin, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So he's saying, as you continue to commit your way to the Lord over here, God will continue to give you mercy and compassion. He wants you to live. But guess what? That might feel like some tension as you are living for God because living for God doesn't always end in that happily ever after story in this life now. Because Jesus himself experienced tribulation and trials. And he said, if you follow me, you're going to experience tribulations and trials too. It's not necessarily the promise of God that we like to circle and highlight in our scripture, but it, it is a promise of God that we will go through various trials. But Jesus himself said, don't fear because I've overcome those trials, okay? So another, uh, another statement, you don't, you don't need to pause because we've kind of already discussed it. God is sanctifying believers through their suffering. That's the same idea as we continue to suffer, problem of pain, suffering, and evil. We will be sanctified, which is having a closer relationship with God over and over and over again. And this passage talks about that here. Um, and, oh, I'm doing a recording here, sorry. <laughs> um, and then... Let's see, God is working all things together for good for his saints. Again, it may not feel good in the moment all of the time as you take a stand for Christ and, and follow him as a disciple and do what Jesus did in his life and model and pattern your life after his. But, but really, God is working everything together for the good, um, ultimately, of those that love him. As, as it says here in this passage. And we know that for those who love God, for the, again, for, for people who have a, an understanding of what the scripture says here, um, God will work everything together for its intended purpose and for its good. And that, that's, a, that's a wonderful promise because sometimes life doesn't feel like it's always going well when you follow Christ and do what Jesus wants you to do. But uh, we can trust in the character of who God is and know that he's working things together for good. So before I get to this next passage, um, I want to bring this slide up one more time. Because I think in my uh, strange mind, um, I, I do believe this relates to the list that you see right there on the PowerPoint screen. I really do believe that. How does this relate to the ideas here that our nation is torn over? I mean, we're, we're all just, uh, I mean, our nation's divided, right? Like we, we see voting rights, climate justice, health care, refugee crisis, racial injustice, income gap, gun violence, hunger, and food insecurity. What we want to do is say, I'm a Republican, and this is what I think about that. Or we say, I'm a Democrat, and this is what I think about that. And Republican, you're stupid. Democrat, you're stupid. And, and what we do is we just get on either side of the party line and just start casting stones at each other. And that's, I really don't think that's what Jesus wants us to do. So what is it we're supposed to do? Well, when I see a problem in my world like this, what I ought to do is not think about this in terms of, well, what does seem right to me or my party line or blah, 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 all that stuff. We have to find out what Jesus thinks about these things. And, you know, I'm always quick and I'm getting, I think I'm trying to get quicker at this in my own, in my own life. But I'm quick when I hear someone's opinion, I say, hey, have, have you run that past the gospel? Have you run that thought by, uh, by the way of Christ that we see in the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John? Well, what, how, did, how did Jesus respond to this in his time? What, what did he do um, when people were hurting uh, for, for whatever reason, and let's just take the you know, racial injustice on just for a light topic this morning and afternoon. Um, when, when Jesus saw that the Jewish people were mistreating the Samaritans, what did he do about that? And we have stories in the gospel of, about how Jesus honored the Samaritans and, and, and valued them and, and taught them and spent time with them. 
um, even giving them lessons or teachings or just healing them. Either way, elevating their status, okay? How, how do we do that? How do, how do I, in my own world, elevate the status of others, not getting on either side of the party line, devaluing either side, which is so easy to do. Oh my gosh, like it's so easy to do that. But let's like break beyond that barrier, which is easy and say, okay, how would Christ respond to this? How can I love my neighbor? How can I actually take care of them? Um, it's, it's when I stop doing what seems right to me and all of these issues that you see on the screen. It's when I stop doing that and I commit my way to the Lord. Well, God, this is how I've been raised to think about that, either Republican or Democrat. I'm going to commit that way to you. And can you check my motives in my heart? Am, am I just getting on either side of the party line and throwing stones and coming down on other people? Can you check my motives there? And, and God gives us a choice, again, to, to do this. Um, and this is how I think it relates to this one point here. As I am committing my way to God, guess what? He's not, he, he doesn't want me to become insular or isolated in and of my own self. The way of Christ is to give to other people. One theologian said, you can sum up the entire New Testament, perhaps even the Old, with one word. And that one word is others. And, and God wants us to ultimately live for other people. So as I... And the litmus test, here is the litmus test that you can know that you are committing your way to God. Are you serving and loving other people? It's the simplest way to know that you are committing your way to God. And this, the, the Apostle John said it in a different way in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He says, you know what? It's so easy to say, God, I love you. God, I love you. You can say, God, I love you to a God you can't see, but you can't even say, neighbor, I love you to somebody that you can. He says you will know that you love God and are actually saying truth when you say you love God when you love your neighbor who you can see. And he says that in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And so as we continue to commit our ways to God, guess what? God's merciful to us and compassionate, which therefore in turn makes us merciful and compassionate to other people. Not just trying to win an argument politically or anything like that. That's not what I'm even trying to do. Um, but what I'm trying to do is say, Commit your way to God. Now, what I'm also not trying to say is, and this is going to end pain, suffering, and evil. No. But what it's doing is we're dealing with pain, suffering, and evil because that's reality. That's, that's the world in which we live. Um, so, so that said, and living for others, that's the litmus test. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use hyperbole, which is just an exaggeration, to, to share this next point. And I do think I'm going to step on somebody's toes. That's why I decided to do a digital recording of this so you'll forget about it next week. But perhaps you won't. Now it's stuck online forever. But I, I'm going to say something that's going to step on your toes. Here we go. God hates it when we get together week after week and sing songs about loving God, but not loving our neighbor. In fact, God despises that. He, he thinks the music that we're offering him every single week, we call it music, he calls it noise. If we're not committing our way to him to the end goal of loving our neighbor. Let me show you this verse, a series of verses in Amos chapter 5, and I'll just let God speak for himself. It's pretty intense. Amos 5, verse 21 says, I hate, I despise, he's talking to his Jewish, the Jewish people, your religious festivals. The very thing God told them to celebrate. He's like, I hate and despise this stuff. He says, your assemblies are a stench to me. Elsewhere in scripture, our worship is supposed to be called a sweet fragrance or an aroma to God, where he's supposed to, and this might sound weird, or be explained weird, but he, he smells he, and takes in and says, oh man, this worship smells good. These are my people. I have a relationship with him. That's the metaphor and language it uses. And that's why it says here, no, 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 your gatherings are actually a stench to me. I mean, think about the worst thing you've ever smelled in your entire life. That's what God thinks about our festivals if they are stripped from loving other people. And I'll get to that major point in a second. 
Verse 22, even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. God's like, I'm done with this stuff. Though you bring me choice fellowship offerings, you're bringing me your best stuff. I will have no regard for them. Listen to this. Away with the noise of your songs. He calls it noise. Just get that out of here. Not music to my ears. I will not listen to the music of your harps. And I do want to ask this question, and I know I'm not here, but I want you to hit pause and see if anybody here in the room knows. Who's, who, who quoted Amos 5.24? Who, who ultimately quoted this? But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. So hit pause, see if there's anybody in the class who knows the answer to that question. Which modern day figure in our modern history quoted that? So I'm assuming you guys took a couple of guesses at that. Martin Luther King Jr. And he, he quotes this and, and really lives it out in this letter that he wrote as he was in the Birmingham jail for crimes that he didn't commit other than having black skin. And he was really trying to gain the ear of the white pastor and clergyman who he thought in Birmingham in that area, if anywhere, these pastors will hear what I have to say. But guess what? Those pastors weren't going to step in for the least, the lost, the lowest of these, the most vulnerable in their own culture. They were not willing to step in and put their life on the line. They weren't willing to commit their way to God. They were going to continue to do what seems right in their own eyes and let Martin Luther King Jr. stay, stay in that prison because he had black skin. How horrific is that? At the same time they were doing that, they would go back into their churches and sing songs about how much God loves this world. Again, just let that sink in for a second. And I do believe God would say the exact same thing to the churches in that time period, and perhaps even to churches in our own world right now that do not take racial injustice serious. I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I won't accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river, God says. Righteousness like a never failing stream. God wants us to commit our ways to him because what we think isn't always right and it ought to manifest itself in living for other people and so again i challenge us with this list do i put the idea front and center of i ought to live for other people commit my way to god and live for them and love them right where they're at or do I just want to win an argument about the problems of pain, suffering, and evil? I think the greatest demonstration of entering a, a, a situation of brokenness, obviously, is Christ. We worship a God who lived his life for the most vulnerable in his world, not siding with Rome, not siding with the Pharisees, not siding with the Sadducees, not saying this is who's ultimately right politically in this system here, but he transcended that and said, guess what? Your job is to love your neighbor as yourself, to enter their situation of pain and suffering. And Jesus did that for us. He gave his life on the cross, right? And so um, the challenge is here for us. And again, I'm being repetitive on purpose. Don't continue to do what seems right in your eyes. I'm going to put it in a different form, the command, the imperative. Commit your way to the Lord. He's going to be merciful towards you. Oh, he longs to be compassionate towards you. Even when your thinking isn't right, at least you're in this area and God's like, I can work with this. That's the relationship. That's the knowledge. That's knowing God personally. And then as we do that, he's going to give us the choice. Oh, and this is the best part. It's our choice, therefore, 
to be like Jesus and live for other people. And guess what? He doesn't force you into that. He graces you into that. And there's a big difference between him forcing you and, and, and God giving grace so that you can actually accomplish this. Because I know if I'm thinking about this, I'm like, man, there's no way I can, I can do this in and of myself. And that's great because God wants us to come to the end of ourselves to say, I need him to be merciful to me. Okay, so that was a lot that was said, um, and there was a video that I was going to show you, um, but I don't think I'm going to do that. I think, I think that's enough to think about right now. I really do. Um, what I want you guys to do now is please get into uh, uh, some smaller groups and have a discussion about this. Um, think through what you just heard and and really ask each other some real honest questions. Uh, do you only function here? See, doing the things that seem right to you. Do you have this real relationship with God where you are committing your ways to him? Ask yourself that question in your group. Be real, be honest, be vulnerable. Um, and then I think one of the hardest things is it, the litmus test. Am I living my life loving other people? Is that really, you know, if, um, if there was somebody that was walking um, side by side with you for a week, you know, with a, with a phone and just recording everything you did, um, would they at the end of the day say, wow, that person is living for others. They love Jesus and they are looking a lot more like Jesus. Again, that's not a shame or a guilt question. Please don't hear it that way. It's more of a pastoral um, encouragement like, man, because I know if somebody was following me around with a camera all day, man, I'd fall short quite a bit and I would need the reminder, hey, John Flores, don't forget to commit your way to God. He wants to be merciful to you. He wants to correct the way that you're thinking um, and challenge the motives in your own heart. Okay, um, well, you guys, thank you so much for listening to this. Um, I really do. Uh, miss you guys and uh, wish I could be there, but I, I just uh, needed a day to process um, the tragedy that I experienced on Wednesday, uh, just being kind of front and center there, hit in the face with that. Um, but thank you for uh, thank you for thinking through these things, and uh, I hope you enjoy the conversation that you're about to have. Um, all right, guys, I will I will see you next week. Uh, God bless. Signing out.